everybody. Thanks so much for joining us right here on The Right View. Tonight, we're joined by senior editor for Human Events and the author of the new book, It's So Hot It's Out Now, The Antifa, Jack Posobiec. Jack, thanks so much for being with us. Um, I feel like people know you. Uh, you're a big voice in conservative politics, but we want to know more about you. So how did you start in all of this? Were you always interested in the political sphere? Oh, wow. So jumping right in with the Oprah stuff. OK, I like it. it. I like it. Straight in. Um, well, I, you know, I really appreciate being here. Um, I just say huge, huge honor to be on. I know we've kind of crossed paths a number of times on, you know, this campaign, that campaign. This We never had the time yeah. to actually sit down. So I, I actually appreciate it, you know, now. And the fact that you're still out here doing the show, that you're taking it to the next level. It's so great. Thank you. And, you know, for me, you know, kind of looking back, I actually was sort of that like run of the mill campus conservative uh, college Republican. I ended up becoming the college Republican chairman for Temple University back in 2005, 2006, um, went on to become the statewide board of the college Republicans and was sort of in that just sort of Republican GOP track, you know, as kind of a, I guess, like a foot soldier back in the 2006 days uh, for the different campaigns. And then I did that for a couple of years and, you know, really got my feet wet in terms of actually doing politics, understand like what re how retail politics works, how uh, geo targeting works, how knocking on doors, get out the vote campaigns work. And um, but then I don't to be honest, I got a little sick of like the establishment kind of side of things. So, you know, like like everybody else would do, I graduated college and moved to China, right? Because why not? Oh, right? doesn't and, everyone do yeah, that? As, as you do, as you do. So I, I ended up working in um, uh, international business, um, started the Chamber of Commerce, then got hired by a consulting firm in international business in Shanghai. Did that for wow. about two years, learned Mandarin. But then decided that I didn't want to go down the international business route, that I wanted to, you know, do something that I felt was a little bit more, I don't know, a little bit more for my country. And so I ended up moving back home 2008 and uh, joined the U.S. military, and then by 2009, joined the U.S. military. So started in the Navy as enlisted, then became an officer as an intelligence officer and uh, with a total focus on China. So use my Mandarin speaking abilities, focus on the PLA, focus on the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And wow. you know, it's it's crazy to see how China has become so much in the news now, and obviously since the past, uh, the events of the past 18 months, yeah. but this has been something where, you know, I've been focused on in terms of that for about about 15 years now, now that I look at back at it. So it's, it's crazy to think that that's wow. how long ago I started, you know, went to my first Mandarin language class and like, what is Ni Hao? What is, how does that work? You know, and then, you know, kind of went all the way forward with it. So um, then in 2016, when, uh, when uh, President Trump announced and then candidate Trump, um, I just thought, I said, this guy's going to win. I mean, this, this is going to clean up because everybody else is just so Oh, you boring. were one of those. You were on the train early. I love oh, it. Oh, from the, yeah. you know, from the, the escalator. escalator um, yeah. You know, I, I, I remember wishing, you know, I remember being at a CPAC actually in 2011 because I would still kind of go to CPACs and those things. And, you know, back in the days when Andrew Breitbart was actually speaking and then he was there and leading, he would, he would, Andrew Breitbart would, uh, I can still remember him going out on the street with a bullhorn screaming at Antifa and Antifa was still around back in those days and just, uh, you don't understand what you're doing. You're mindless automatons. You're, you've been subjugated and mind controlled by the mainstream media and you're doing it. And it's just I'm sure wild, that went right? over really well, by the way. Oh, totally. <laughs> and then, so I remember though that, and it was a surprise guest and someone said, who's coming, who's coming. And they said, well, I think, I think Donald Trump is coming. What? Coming to CPAC? Yeah. And this was, this would have been 2011 and he got up and spoke. And I remember thinking, man, I wish this guy would run. And oh, yeah, fun I thought fact, of something. you know, total political trivia. And not everybody remembers this one. The person who introduced uh, Trump at that CPAC that brought him up on stage was actually none other than Ted Cruz. <gasps> Wow. Wow. And look at the, the, the track they've been on. Isn't that wow, wild? So 10 years ago, you know, you've got, you've got, uh, you've got Donald Trump coming as a speaker, Ted Cruz, and, you know, I guess he had just been elected 2010. Yeah. So he's a first year Senator, not even, you know, wow. fully in, uh, you know, hasn't completed a full year at that point, probably half a year 
because it's or not even half a year. He's just elected because CPAC's yeah. usually February. So he's like been in the Senate for like five minutes and there's, you know, uh, and here comes Donald Trump and the two of them rub. So a lot of that Tea Party energy, some of the early Ron Paul libertarian type energy was there. And I remember that it was this this huge grassroots explosion of things. And, you know, we thought maybe it would happen in 2012, didn't happen then, ended up happening 2015, 2016. And I was just like, this, this is the guy. So 2016, I was actually on deployment in East Asia for the the la the first six months of the year, and that ended up being my last deployment with the military. And uh, but in my spare time, I'd be like on the internet, going back to my old friends in Pennsylvania politics, saying, "Hey, you know, Ted Christian is running the statewide campaign, and he oh, needs poll watchers, and he needs this, and Michelle's helping him out. That's uh, Ted's wife, Michelle, yeah. and you know, and we got to get him up." And I remember like. Um, you know, just going on Reddit and social media and figuring out well, what can I do because I'm far away. And then my social media profile just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger from those early days. And uh, eventually kind of started getting some offers in the conservative media space and, you know, talked about it with my uh, my fiance at the time, my now wife. And I, I said, look, you know, I, I want to give this this crazy thing a shot. And, and, and here we are. And it's been about five years since then. And we're, you know, we're still we're still riding it. Wow. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for your service. And I think it's rather incredible to see that you're a person who uh, you, you just said you left international business, which we know can be a very lucrative thing to serve your country. I mean, Jack, that's that's huge. That's a really big deal. Obviously, it seems like it's all worked out for you, um, but that's that's really amazing. And, and you don't hear often about that. It usually goes the other way. People usually are like, well, let me take the money and run and let me not well, you know, do you. What, what's great I, for my country. I really appreciate you saying that too, because um, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, you get you get flack for basically everything. I always say, you know, you everything. say on Twitter, you stay yeah. on Twitter long enough, you'll get accused of everything and, and totally. literally you will. And um, the one that always makes me laugh is when people say, oh, this guy, he's, he's just doing it for the money, right? He's, oh he's just in it for the money. He's just trying to make bank. I'm like, no, 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 no. Jack, say, they say the same thing to us. Why don't you ask my father-in-law how much <laughs> money he's right. made since he came down that escalator in June of 2015? Ask how much money he's lost for his company. He didn't take a salary as president. All of these people that say that, it's obviously ridiculous. And especially in your case, as you're pointing out. I mean, yeah, I'm like, you no, know, no, no. If I if I wanted to make money, I I, I could have stepped you away. You could have done it. I well, if I wanted to sell out to China, right, the way that so many others in international business do and so many other American companies, I would have just yeah. sat right there in Shanghai and said, Hey, let's you know, let's let's work on this. Let's build up Shanghai Disneyland. Let's knock down these houses so we can get that maglev up and get that, you know, that magnetic high speed train, the high speed rail going. You know, who cares about these? Oh, what you got some historic buildings that have been there for 500 years. Psh, get rid of them. Who needs those? Right. We need progress, baby. Right. And let's get some American firms in here and do it. All right. A little piece of this deal, a little piece of that. Deal. I mean, that's how it works. Right. That's how it works. Yeah. Um, and not to mention the just the, the vast amounts of manufacturing that gets done, the pharmaceutical manufacturing and everything that gets done in terms of the like put it this way, you know, I, I still, you know, maintain if you know, I still talk to some of the guys that then it ended up staying. They they all made out like bandits throughout the pandemic. They all I made bet. out like absolute mm -hmm. bandits getting on the track of the the mask manufacturing um the ventilators when that was going on just mm -hmm. everything that they could source out of china they did and they're consulting firms that made out like absolute bandits and, and to, to take your your father-in-law's line i mean they, they are ripping off the american people they're just and i you know, i gotta tell you i i didn't feel good with it i didn't feel right about it and um you know i learned a lot but i said you know what i i don't want to do this i just don't want to do this good for you I, that's a tough call to make obviously uh, the, the country appreciates it. We're all grateful you did. You've obviously become a, a voice in the conservative arena. Uh, and I want to get to your book in a minute because you have a book you wrote about Antifa. But I, I want to stay on China for a second because sure. I, I feel like my father-in-law was so strong on, on warning us about China. I mean, he was the first president, at least in my lifetime, to stand up to China the way he did, to, to take care of or at least start to try and take care of a problem that had been progressing over decades. And, you know, we had the China trade agreement phase one signed with Donald Trump. Now, how, where do you think we are, Jack, with China? Because obviously we know that Joe Biden and his family have been very cozy with China. Um, 
We know that they've taken a lot of money from China. We know that Joe Biden has not stood up to uh, Xi Jinping in any way, shape or form. I don't think we anticipate it happening. I was with my father-in-law this past weekend in my home state of North Carolina, and he gave a speech down there, his first speech in a couple of months. And he said that he thinks that China should pay reparations, not just to the United States, but to the entire world for what happened during the COVID pandemic, because we know it leaked out of a lab in um, Wuhan. We we know that it, it's very questionable as to whether or not that was uh, a man-made virus, but it seems like it's headed in that direction. And it was on their watch that this happened and this, this global pandemic. What's your take on what's happening with China right now? Well, so it's it's really amazing if you look at it from from my perspective, right? You know, like like I said, I've been looking at China for 15 years, and yeah. and sort of the the broader focus of you know, and I talk about actually in the book, um, you know, Antifa as being sort of a red front group in the in the the communist vein, in the same way that the original Antifa was a red front group for the Soviet Union. Now Antifa, now there's no direct, you know, I wouldn't say there's a direct link between the CCP and Antifa, but that we've been able to identify. However, you can see uh, they certainly have the same targets. They certainly have the same aims and the same goals in weakening the United States, destabilizing our republic and usurping, really usurping the world order to replace it with one that's backed by China, Russia and Iran. And so What's really interesting to, to me personally, as a guy who you know was learning about China 2006, 2007, living there, um, going forward, that now all of these different aspects and concepts, and you know, what's the Wuhan Institute of Virology? What's the what's the Chinese Academy of Science? Shi Li, and who are all these different people that are involved in this? And why is it that the NGOs are getting money from our NIH and going through? And this is all stuff that we knew sort of in the China watcher community, the China hands that some people call it. Um, but it's it's never anything that broke out into the mainstream conversation before. And to a point where if you go back to that original 2015, 2016 campaign for president from Donald Trump, he would talk about China and they made fun of him. They ridiculed him. This it became a meme. There's, you know, some of those China, 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 China. you know, videos that, that they would yes. make uh, over and over, you know, and almost like, oh, why is this guy talking about China so much? This is silly. This is a joke. You know, they all they do is make us cheap stuff and cheap TVs, and they're no threat to us. And it doesn't matter that they've hollowed out our manufacturing base and that they've weakened the middle class and they're hurting the working class. Well, who who cares? You know, we're just going to be a service economy anyway, and we're all going to move to automation. It doesn't matter. You know, we're a nation in decline, et cetera, et cetera. Right? This the whole refrain. And in just the six years it's been since then. I've seen that whole relationship and the whole public perception of China in the West really take a complete 180 turn. It is like night and day. It is black and white. And, you know, there's a lot of people now who not just when it comes to lab leak theory, but when it comes to relations between the West and China, Japan and China, India and China, et cetera, et cetera, where they really don't want to give credit to Donald J. Trump for being the man who said, well, we, we are that. going to pivot, right? Yeah. We are going to pivot on this. You know, that was Obama's thing. Remember the pivot to Asia? No, we're going to pivot on Asia. And that was Donald Trump. And you can see that, by the way, in, you know, Biden will never say this publicly or never admit it. Tony Blinken won't bring it up. They've continued a lot of the tariffs that have gone on. They're continuing to block this, obviously block funding uh, to the Wuhan Institute. Of course they should. We should be investigating yeah. all of it. We should be investigating specifically what was going on there in terms of these gain of function research. Um, I mean, I've been, you know, I've learned, been talking to so many microbiologists about this over the past couple of months and what I'm digging into to get smart on all of that stuff, you know, but when you look at some of the experiments they were doing specifically with these, the spike proteins, remember that that's what we're all, we are, we're always told it's the spike proteins and that's how it hits the, uh, the ACE2 receptors in the human lungs, and we haven't ever seen anything like this before. And, you know, go back to those early, you know, I watched all the task force meetings. I actually paid attention, which I don't, I guess the rest of the media didn't, but they were talking about these spike two, these spike proteins attaching to the ACE2 receptors. And that's why uh, COVID-19 was so prevalent. That's why it was able to spread so well. But then you go back and you actually look at the nuts and bolts of the projects and the gain of function research. That's the exact thing that Shi Zhongli 
and Peter Daszak through the EcoHealth Alliance were looking at in the Wuhan lab. And there were other people involved in these experiments as well. But so you really have to ask the question, you say, wait a minute, well, you just gave me a briefing talking about all this stuff. And here I see 2016, 2017, 2018, this research that's being done where they're seemingly talking about the exact same thing. And you're but then, you know, you've got Dr. Fauci and a whole litany of, of oh, uh, you know, CCP sycophants from the WHO, mm -hmm. et cetera, saying, oh, don't worry about that. Don't ask that question. This probably just came from a wet market, probably came, you know, arose naturally. I say, OK, if it arose naturally, you know, where, where's the village? Where's the town? Where's the, you know, where's the, the local population? Like, I, I know about China, right? I know that Wuhan is 1000 miles away from where those caves are in Quinming, right? That, that is not close, right? That geography. So Wuhan is, is kind of like central or eastern China. Uh, Quinming, where these caves are, that's that's all the way down towards the border with Vietnam, right? This is very far away. So unless you're telling me that a diseased bat was able to fly 1,000 miles, you know, to the city of Wuhan, yeah. We never you know, know. Something, Those bats, something else is going on here. You never know, Jack, right? I don't know. No. Maybe it did. You know, maybe he had like, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you know maybe he had, <laughs> maybe maybe ate some really good, maybe he had the cicadas, right? Maybe they had some good cicadas and they were able to superpower true. him up. That's true. Uh, but the reality is they don't want to, they don't want us to talk about it. They don't want to deal with it. The fact that Donald Trump was the one that originally started talking about, well, perhaps it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, perhaps it came from this lab. They wanted nothing to do with it. They hate my father-in-law so much. He can be right about nothing. They don't want to give him credit for anything. Um, just before we started this um, show, you and I were talking about the fact that they're now obsessed with his pants possibly being on Yeah, back. so you, you guys I'm go sorry. down there and you have this, you have this great speech. You know, uh, he gives a, you know, he gives a pretty monumental speech. I think his yeah. first speech in like four months since the last CPAC. Um, you obviously made a huge announcement uh, there as well. And, um, you know, and you're and you're waiting to see. Oh, and, and then he dropped this huge number, right? Ten trillion. That's I mean, what a, what a visual that is. Like, you're never going to forget that number, right? Ten trillion dollars. That's how much they owe. And it's one of those things where if it was any other situation, you would say, well, that sounds crazy, right? That that doesn't make any sense. Ten trillion dollars. That number doesn't even you know, boggles the imagination. It's multiple yeah, times higher than our me. entire budget. Um, I think the only thing bigger than it is our debt right now. Yeah, um, exactly. But, you know, when you look at the scale of this and the fact that this is a pandemic, four million people around the world have been killed untold. I mean, we still haven't been able to calculate the economic devastation from this. And, you know, some of the reporting that we're doing at Human Events now it, and we're looking into this, we're, we're seeing that U.S. intelligence agencies had indications that there were conversations at the highest levels of the CCP where they made the strategic decision to say, look, if we have to take an economic and a health hit, we want everyone to have to take that hit along with us, right? And so people say, well, oh, well, you know, was it, was it China that, you know, that started the ball rolling? No, it wasn't China, it was Italy. It was when Italy got bad that's when everybody realized the full yeah. scope and scale of this because they hit Italy first, this thing hit Italy first, and then it spread from there. It went throughout the, the entire world. It went throughout the entire world. It's hitting India now very badly. You're seeing variants pop up in Japan, variants hitting in Taiwan. Japan, of course, looking at possibly canceling the Olympics again, right? Actually, I, I spoke to a guy who has um, who's had meetings with the IOC on this. I mean, you look at the devastation that that would do to those sports and those athletes yeah. and the millions of dollars that goes into that. You go uh, four years, five years, six years without an Olympics, you're killing those sports because all, Isn't you know, it, it all goes downstream. Though, Jack, I, I was just talking to, not to get off the topic, but I was talking to my husband about it this weekend. And I was like, aren't, aren't the Olympics supposed to start like in a month? Nobody's heard anything about them, right? Is it a little weird that there's just nothing? Shouldn't we be getting excited about them? I guess people are just like, well, it might not happen, so they're not talking about it. There's no promotion, right? Is that strange to anybody? Right. It's it this this entire thing needs to be turned back around and laid at the feet of Xi Jinping, 
the CCP and understanding what happened in Beijing and having a full and actual accounting of this, one that isn't headed up, by the way, by the likes of Peter Daszak, right. who actually has a financial incentive and a conflict of interest to get people to stop looking at this. And, you know, they tried to lie about this for as long as possible. We've seen now the Fauci emails. We know that they had the same concerns that every single one of us just average people looking at the situation had in real time, right? And that's mm -hmm. the key. You've got people deleting their Twitter accounts now, doctors and officials, because we're going through and we can see the pronouncements and declarations and proclamations that they were making on Twitter are the exact opposite of what they were saying in those emails to Dr. Fauci. It's really unbelievable stuff. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much time with China, but I do find it very interesting because you had so much experience there. You spent so much time there. And just to get your insight on that, I think is great. Um, I want to talk about your book, The Antifa, Stories from Inside the Black Bloc. So tell me, first of all, about the book. I, I know you went like undercover in Chaz, the autonomous right. zone in Seattle. Um, tell me a little bit about why you wrote the book, what's inside, and, and I want to hear about your undercover experience. Yeah, so, um, you know, the book starts out where we're talking about really the background of taking people directly into the Oval Office. And it's a conversation between then President Trump and FBI Director Chris Wray, and they're right across the Resolute desk. Um, and, you know, the president, we all know what he's saying, right? When it comes to Antifa, we know exactly what he's saying. Yes. Because, and, and people don't, you know, I know you know this, but most people don't know that, you know, in private, he's exactly the same as he is in public. Exactly, there are no yeah. two versions of him. Um, uh, potentially use a little bit more colorful language in private, but we'll leave it at that. Um, and he's going to Ray and saying, you got to go after these guys. I'm looking at this night after night in Portland, in Washington, D.C., and, and we have a series of conversations never before published all the way through talking about this nefarious group. And Chris Ray sits there across the Resolute desks, shrugs his shoulders and says, you know, Antifa is really more of an ideology. And we don't police ideologies in the United States. But if somebody commits a crime, you can be sure that we'll go after them. Well, we've seen the types of crimes they go after. And we've seen the type of one ideology they'll go after. And that's mm -hmm. if you are an America first MAGA supporter, right? right? You can get banned from social media. You can get kicked off of airplanes. You can get kicked off of banks. You can get They'll fired break, from your break job. Break your door down in the middle of the night. Yeah, break your door down you. in the middle of the night. Yeah. Completely uh, seeing now the effects of a two-tier justice system. And so uh, we go through and actually document all of this because the mainstream media has been completely derelict in their duty when it comes to this organization. And I say, look, if there are people out there regardless of what side of the aisle they're on or whatever it is, if they're out there pushing extremism and pushing violence and pushing these extreme methods, right? Research them, go after them, prosecute yeah. them, give us all the information, give us the reporting. But what the mainstream media has done is whitewash this group in order to only focus on groups that fit their agenda. So we look into this book, Chaz is a perfect example of that. And I break it down in, in this way, um, it's like the mainstream media would show up during the daytime. And during the day, it almost seemed like Chaz wasn't so bad, right? Um, despite, you know, of course, the initial clashes and you have this, this armed uprising and creating a no-go zone with, yes, actual armed militia guarding checkpoints, right? During the day, though, it was kind of, you know, um, almost like a fish concert, like a hippie jam band kind of thing. Um, you'd have you have prevalent drugs all over the place, tourists, day trippers, people going in and out. And so the mainstream media would set up their cameras at the top of the street outside of Kale Anderson Park, which is the name of the park there, 12 square blocks, and say, look, there's no police and everything's fine and people summer are living in peace and harmony. It's the summer of love, yeah. as Mayor Jenny Durkin stated. Mayor Jenny Durkin, who will now no longer be running for re-election in the city of Seattle. I wonder why that is. Mm, interesting. And police chief Carmen Best, who was the chief of uh, African-American woman, she was the head of the Seattle police, Seattle police chief during this time. She actually resigned. Yeah. In response to all of this, she's come out publicly and stated, basically backed up everything what I'm saying, that it was a complete misinformation campaign going on about Chaz because the minute night fell, those mainstream media reporters would leave. They would go back. The lights would get, turn off. The, cam the, the little red dot on the camera would go away. And myself and a cadre of other journalists, you know, 
<laughs> not, not, not any, you know, high paid corporate journalists or anything like that would stay behind undercover incognito. And we would have nothing more than our cell phones, right? But going up and actually getting into these circles, staying there, seeing the violence that broke out, because once they realized that there were no police there, that sent a message to every criminal element in Seattle and the surrounding areas that this is a place where you can go and commit crimes and you will not be prosecuted. We saw vandalism, we saw violence, we saw theft, burglary, arson um up I, I saw people being held at gunpoint uh, in multiple cases this guy the warlord raz is racking his nine millimeter right in front of me chasing people down the street if they didn't follow his you know his rules and his edicts which you know it's um you know he's not elected to anything he's not a, he's a soundcloud rapper actually oh, and as we left um we did a video where we kind of revealed that we were there as we were walking out and i said I put out a direct challenge to Mayor Dirk and I said, you need to shut this down right now. This is going to get bad. There are people getting attacked in here and it's only going to get worse. Just a couple nights after I left was the first shooting in there. The first, it was a series of uh, five shootings on four separate occasions. It did lead to two African-American teenagers being killed, multiple people being shot in there. Uh, a homeless person stabbed and murdered his girlfriend and then later committed suicide in the park. Uh, this thing spiraled out of control very, very quickly. And then, of course, she did what we all knew she would have to do, call the police and get them in there. And so it's it's very horrific to, you know, have known that we could see how this thing was going and that our elected leaders or these elected leaders let the citizens of Seattle, right? Because you have people, residents that are living there yeah. while this is all going on. You have business owners trying to just keep their inventory intact and, you know, they'll put up whatever flags and signs and different things in their businesses kind of saying like, hey, you know, pass over my place. I'm I'm with you. I'm, I'm not one of them. But it didn't matter, right? It didn't matter. And the problem is, in and you know quite frankly this is something where i think that mayor jenny durkin should be held financially liable if not criminally liable for the violence the mayhem and the death that took place on her watch because she allowed it to happen yeah and by the way jack what do you think would have happened if this was a group that identified themselves as being on the right like think <laughs> about right i mean it's yeah. it's like comical almost because think about the hysteria that we would have seen by within the mainstream media, people would have gone out of their mind about this. It would have been nonstop, 24 hour a day coverage. But because these folks in Antifa somehow uh, align themselves with the left, it kind of just gets glossed over. Um, it, it's it's actually that is that is one of the scariest parts of all of this to me because I say it all the time. Look, journalism truly feels like it is dead in America. People are just pushing forward an agenda. People are no longer disseminating facts and information. Um, but what's the story with Antifa? I mean, where did it come from? Why is it such a, you know, a prevalent thing that doesn't get talked about? And then you have people like Christopher Ray. Um, remember, Jerry Nadler said that it was an idea. Like, these people are not giving it any credence. It is obviously a very real group. So what is the story with them? So what I've done here in the book is really create a compendium for anybody who wants to read it. And we have it up at antifabook.com. And uh, it's, it's available pretty much everywhere books are sold that I, I sort of joke that once you read this book, you will go to anyone who says that Antifa is just an idea and think of them as a lunatic because- If you didn't you already. Say, yeah, if you don't already, right? So we'll say, is Antifa an idea? Yeah, the same way that radical Islam is like an idea, but it's an idea that forms movements. It's an idea that radicalizes people. And those movements form networks, those movements form cells, and then those cells go out and commit operations, whether that be uh, wanton destruction, whether it be the black block, and that's actually the, the subtitle of it. That's when you see them marching out in force. They're all in black garb. That's being That's done, by the way, so that certain members of that group, when we break down the hierarchy in the book, certain members who have pre-planned to go out and commit crimes can then blend black in back into the black bloc so that they are now very much harder to be able to prosecute them. This is what we saw 
at President Trump's inauguration, the attack on his inauguration. Remember that we we talk about the peaceful transfer of power. Well, we didn't have one 2016 to 2017 because of this attack. Um, attack that I not only was um, involved in, in terms of them blocking my car, my wife's in the car, my brother's in the car. Oh, wow. um, they're coming across the road, screaming at us, you know, pounding. Of course, I get out of the car because me being me. Um, and uh, to confront them. But I was actually even infiltrating some of their meetings prior to that in a church basement in Washington, D.C. And so we go through everything that they told us, how highly sophisticated their planning is, the cells are, they call them working groups that they put together. So when you're looking at it, it seems like it's just a hodgepodge of people walking around in black. No, no, no. There's something much more sophisticated in here. There is a hierarchy. They do have connections to what they call affinity groups. That's that's groups in other areas. They will attempt to infiltrate other groups by claiming that there's some name that they're up, that they're not. And the Black Lives Matter movement, and we line this out in the book, gave them the perfect cover to go out to commit their nefarious acts throughout all of 20, uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, and of course, throughout tw the summer of 2020. So what I do here is put together also the comprehensive timeline of every uh, every event of violence throughout the entire summer of rage 2020, dates, times, location, situation, action, outcome, where you can just go through boom, 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 boom. Because remember, you know, go, looking back at it, it just seems like it was a whole mess of every single night there was something, every single day there was this shooting, there was that yeah. shooting. We break down every single piece of it so that when you look back at it, you're wondering, wow, I, I can't believe that this was, and it's almost every single day. Of course, it starts at the end of May, goes throughout June, and it's peppered throughout with my own personal experiences, um, investigations that I was able to conduct while I was there, going into the Chaz, uh, being in Washington, D.C. for those nights when they attacked the uh, the historic St. John's Church right outside the White House when they tried to set that on fire. Um throughout all the different types of military response and government response that we saw in the summer of 2020, that so many of these cities with Democrat mayors and the states that had Democrat governors refused, refused to do, by the way, you know, back in the, if this were the 1960s, the 1970s, even the 1990s, right? The LA riots, the National Guard and the military are right there and they're yep. highly trained to serve this purpose. Those governors let those cities burn. They did. They absolutely did. We saw it day after day after day, night after night. It was it was shocking that they continued to allow this. Well, what an interesting book. I, I hope everybody gets a chance to to read it. I think that we should all want to be informed on this because you're not going to get the information out there from watching TV. We know that. Um, and good luck, by the way, like trying to Google it and find it. You know, we, we know who's in charge of Google. Um, you have two young kids, Jack, do you not? I do, yeah. How old are they? Uh, I've got a six-month-old and a just-turned-three-year-old. Oh, wow. So our kids are, are kind of similar. I have a one- and a three-year-old Yeah, I was going to well. say, I think yours are right around the same age, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I got to tell you, I think constantly about, you know, what sort of future are our children going to have. My kids and your kids are very young, but I do start thinking about schools. I, I think about what are they being taught in schools? Are they being educated? Are they being indoctrinated? Um, where do you sit with all of um, the things happening with things like critical race theory, um, the, the way that it seems like very clearly there was an entire group of youth in America that was sort of indoctrinated already from high school to college campuses um, who are now you know, just of voting age and feel like they hate America. Where do you stand on this and what's your plan for your kids? Well, you know, something I've got to say um, that, you know, I, I was thinking about even before we got on here, but just I, I really want to congratulate you on your recent decision and the message that you sent to young families throughout this country. Say, you know, you could have run and would have been highly competitive in that seat uh, in the Senate, and everybody knows that, but you said that you wanted to spend more time with your kids and you wanted to raise them and make sure that they got the, and you know, let's face it, you're, <laughs> you're running for office and then becoming a Senator, uh, you know, that that's a huge demand on your time and it, and it right. just is what it is. So, you know, that's, that's gotta be outsourced. And so I think that there, you're starting to see this now, uh, particularly with conservatives, particularly with Christians and other, um, other people's of other people of faith that 
we're sort of re we're questioning again what should the role of parents be in raising kids and should we be taking more of a hands-on approach you know we've you know we've sort of outsourced kids to daycares or to schools for so many time you know for so many years and that you know the latchkey kids you know and that sort of was the idea but um I, I think that's really big and I think that's really admirable. And I, and so I, you. I applaud you for doing that and sending that message out there that, you know, Thank you. you know, and, and, you know, that's something where my wife is, is also in agreement with you that, that parents having um, that time, right. Just spending that much mm -hmm. time with your kids is number one, the best, the absolute best defense we have against the, you know, sort of the secular uh, social justice warfare that's out there and it's everywhere. So yes, part though, um, you are seeing you are seeing suburban parents th right now, though, I will say this become radicalized in the good way, <laughs> in a way that I've never seen before over this critical race theory stuff, because right. you've got parents in like Loudoun County, Virginia, which is like huge affluence, um, you know, area. I think it's actually the per capita highest um, highest grossing county in the country. They're wow. banding together. Um, I talked to a family that was down in Virginia Beach that they're putting groups together based off of what Loudoun County is doing. They are running for school boards to fight this thing. They are putting in lawsuits if they can. They're moving their kids out of these schools. They're saying, I don't want this anymore. So I think you're going to see a multi-tiered approach from not only the conservative families, but also just sort of your middle of the road, you know, and we would say normies, you know, where they're going to say, look, you know, I don't want any politics. I just want history. I want yeah. my kids taught the history of this country. I want them to understand what the flag means, the red, white, and blue. I want them to understand what the 4th of July is. I want them to understand why we stand up um, and put our hand over our hearts before every sporting event, you know, all of these basic, um, you know, basic tenets of patriotism mm -hmm. that for some reason the left has decided to politicize. You know, I don't think that's something that people want when they go to those things. You, know, you don't want sports politicized. You don't want school politicized. But there's been something about critical race theory then. And when you look at critical theory in general, uh, James Lindsay had a quote the other day that I thought was really good. Uh, the the basic premise of critical theory is looking at your nation's flag, finding the threads that you can pull and then pulling them until it's completely torn apart. Wow. And that's it. Right. That's the only thing that critical theory is. And he's 100 percent right now. He's yeah. like a leftist. He's like a liberal, um, you know, saying this stuff. And that's exactly right, that if we you know, find every little flaw because every country has them, um, you know, we will tear this country apart. But Johnny Cash has that great song called the ragged old flag. And he says, yeah, that that flag up there is pretty ragged. And it's, you know, it's been through a lot. And but you know what? It's still standing. And that means something. And we are awful proud of our ragged old flag. And that's the difference. And I think we really need to get back to that. So you're going to see that, by the way, you know, going through um, the, sort of the action plan on that. You're going to see parents banding together to fight against these crazy schools. Um, they're going to fight against the teachers unions. They're going to fight against critical race theory. There's going to be lawfare, legal action brought by, and these, some of these in you know, Loudoun County, these are families of means um, who have the ability to do that. Then you're also going to see, I think you're going to see parents checking out of the public school system. They're gonna be yeah. looking at charter schools, magnets, private schools, religious schools, and given all the COVID craziness in terms of are we locked down, are we not locked down, are we on Zoom, are we not on Zoom, masks, no masks, I think you're gonna see a return to uh, you know, teaching pods. I think you're gonna see a return to a sort of, not just homeschooling, but you'll see more uh, growth in homeschooling, but you'll also see a return to you know, maybe one community gets together a couple of teachers and those teachers teach on a certain day of the week and they call, you know, that's what we do. I'm, I'm Catholic in my parish. That's what we have. And so we have, we call them teaching pods, right? We call mm -hmm. them school pods. And so it's a number of homeschool families that band together and they then, you know, if some, you know, put together the money, hire a private teacher and that's it. And it's almost like a tutor. So it's, it's sort of like a 21st century version of the one room schoolhouse. Um, that's done in a very cool way. And it's actually something where the innovation right now is exploding because, hey, this is just supply and demand, folks. You know, there is a huge market for schools that are actually teaching kids the STEM stuff, you know, skills that they want to learn, um, teaching them the great books, teaching them the classics, oh, understanding things, where things that'll help from, them in the future. And things that Jack? they need. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that they got taught something that would actually impact their future lives and, and be useful for them. You know, I think you're right. I think it's very interesting because until I became a parent, 
I didn't fully grasp this, but when you start messing you don't with get people's it. You kids, can't. yeah, you don't. When you start messing with people's kids, forget about it. People who had been on the sidelines their whole life are like, yeah. you do not mess with my children. You are, that is the wrong thing. These people get crazed. And like you're saying, crazed in a good way, I think. Because um, you're, you're tripping, you're tripping a, that is a primal biological, yes. spiritual short That's circuit right. that people are just hardwired with. Yep. You're just absolutely hardwired. You're messing with my kids. You're, yeah, you're messing right. with my kids. And, and thank you. Those were really kind words you said about me. Um, look again, I, I wouldn't have, uh, I mean, it. You, I, I really mean that. Thank you. If you would have asked me 15 years ago, if, if I had the opportunity that I, I felt like I had to, to run for this Senate seat and, and to be very competitive, um, would I have chosen to do that or to spend more time with my kids? I would have said you're crazy for me to have made the decision that I did. But then once yeah. you have kids and you see how really influential day to day the the time that they spend with you is. And I, look, sure, I could have had someone else raise my children, but I don't want to do that. I, I want to be the person that influences their life. I want my husband to influence their life more than anybody. Um, and so it was a really tough decision to make. I hope that I get another opportunity um, in the future. I don't know if I will, but for me right now, this was the, the right decision for our family. If I'm the only person I've got to consider in things, then, you know, sure, I would have done it. But once you have kids, once you get married, you know, you, you make a vow um, for better or worse to go through things together. And this was the, the right decision for our family. Um, but I think it'll be really interesting over the next five to 10 years to see all these things that you say um, are, are likely going to happen because parents have had it. They are done with it. They do not want their kids indoctrinated with hate. And I just heard about this New York Times board member who was out, apparently, I don't know if you heard about this, out on Long Island last weekend yeah, and was yeah, like beside clip. herself, Jack, because she saw Amer so many American flags and to her, that represented some sort of like hate speech or something. Are these people crazy? I mean, I, I don't know how far outside of like any sort of rational thought we have gotten that someone can misconstrue seeing American flags while we're in the United States of America as a negative. What is this? What is going on? You know, so. And we were talking a little bit before we got on. Uh, I, I mentioned how my wife was born in the Soviet Union. And she'd been here for about 15 years. And one thing that she used to say was that when she first got to the United States, she said, wow, you guys, you really love your flag. <laughs> you know, she's because she's been, you know, all over Europe, you know, going to different parts of Europe is, you know, it's it's the travel's not so hard for her because she's right there. Um, and she's like, I've been to all these places, but man, you guys just you really you have that flag everywhere. You're saluting it all the time. You're putting your hand over your heart before all these games. You know what? I don't see that anywhere. I don't see that's kind of you guys just love that thing. And I was like, well, so we love our country, you know. And it's that's it's that's what true. it's about. And and then I asked her about that. I said, well, do you think it's still like that? And she's like, I think that I think that most Americans are like that. But you, it's so strange to me that she says, you know, it's not so much that you know America is. Not most Americans are trying to hate their flag, which is like it's like you're losing part of yourself. It's like you're losing part of what America used to be and what America used to stand for. And so, you know, I, I always find it just so enlightening, you know, talking to her about this kind of stuff because she does sort of, sort of have that, you know, view of having grown up in a different place and grown up in a different system, a system of communist oppression yeah. and from that totalitarian worldview to say that, you know, the fact that you guys have this country and you're not you're not forced you know you're not forced to fly the no, nobody's forced to put their flag up in front That's of their right. house if it's memorial day we just had you know fourth of july you know you don't have to do that you can sit and watch netflix and do whatever and you know you're, you're not required to do any of those things but so many people do it anyway and this is something when we look at american tradition and i think as a father about stuff that i want to pass on to my kids you know my son just turned three and so he's kind of at the point where he's starting to kind of get things become more aware so i made a huge deal out of that on memorial day that we're putting up the flag and then we we actually went on a bike ride all around our neighborhood and i, I was pointing out all the flags that were up and he was oh, like red so white nice. and blue red white and blue red white and blue so just from a very young age you know you gotta start them young with this stuff that yeah. uh you know this is the flag 
And this is, you know, he, he doesn't get, you know, obviously what it is or anything, but this is something that's important because I'm giving it energy. I'm giving mm-hmm. it attention and kids, you know, even at the end, you, obviously, you know, um, they understand attention. They understand right. everything in terms of attention. That's, that's basically all they want. So when you're giving something that much attention, even at a very early age, they understand, Hey, this is something important versus, you know, if they see dad just sitting and, you know, watching Netflix all day long, well, he's going to think, well, the Netflix is important, right? So this, right. you know, kids, they, they're watching. <laughs> they oh, they're up, they're they watching everything. everything. You don't even That's know. totally. You don't even know what they're watching. That's right. I can tell you, both of my kids and my daughter will be two in August. Both of my kids know what the American flag is, and they'll tell you anytime they see an American flag, they will both point it out and tell you about it. Um, it it's it's you're right. You got to start it young. You got to. I can tell you, both of my children, when they say the Pledge of Allegiance, when uh, they sing the national anthem, will be putting their hands over their hearts. They will be standing up for our American flag. That is something I, I truly intend to instill in both of them. Um, I, I want to ask you this. This is sort of how I, I like to wrap up the show, and I ask everybody this. Jack, what do you think is the best part of America, and what do you think is the biggest threat to our future? So... You know, I'm sure my publishers want me to say the best part of America is that you can buy books like the Antifa <laughs> and our biggest threat is Antifa. You got it in. CCP. Look at that. You know, that, that's, that's the, you know, the, I guess the, the corporate answer. Um, but no, I, 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 I want to be serious. Um, the, cause we're being real here. We're being real here. This is the yeah, right view after all. That is. Um, you know, I think the best part of America is that we are a country that looks forward in many cases, or that traditionally we've been a country that looks forward, you know, and when you get to Europe and I have, I still have family back there, you know, they are so focused on the past. They're always fighting the last war or they're fighting a war that was 200 years ago, 300 years ago. But one of America's unique benefits in that we are a young country is that, you know, we do, we have a history, but we don't have a history that's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years long, like some of these places. And traditionally, America has always been a country that's looking forward, looking at the future, it's looking to be innovative, right? You know, this is this was at one point, uh, when you think of the state of California, right, this was the entire, you know, sort of um, ethos of the state of California was innovation, future, um, the you know real progress, not progressivism, but real actual you know human yeah. progress. And I think the biggest danger to America is is entropy, um, and just that gravity of you know kind of what we just said about this this idea of if we're going to just start looking backwards now and think about well what about this thing that happened a hundred years ago what about this thing that happened 200 years ago oh, it, was, it wasn't that bad and you know falling all over ourselves and reforming our entire society to be one that's constantly apologizing rather than saying look if there were problems we're going to deal with it we're going to figure it out we're going to make it better but we are moving forward and we are going to be on that train towards the future right i think that's and i think that if we stay in that mode i think if we stay in that forward-looking mode that this country can do anything and that there isn't anything any challenge the ccp antifa whatever it is that we can't defeat as long as we keep that in mind that's why um, I actually, you know, one thing that, you know, so CPAC was in Orlando this year and I took the, um, I took the family down to Cape Canaveral, right? And I was like, yeah, let's go to Cape Canaveral. Let's see the spaceships, right? Yeah. How cool would this be, right? And I can remember, and I, and it was very revealing and I, I, I it was kind of insightful and I was, you know, reflecting a lot on this, that when I went to Cape Canaveral back in the nineties, my dad took me there, I actually got to see a space shuttle on the lander, right? As or the oh, launcher, wow. I guess, before it was, cool. you know, it wasn't it wasn't launching that day, but it was like that's spaceship, you know, and that just, you know, yeah. and that, you know, you get having watched all the, you know, the sci-fi shows and everything, you know, that's that's a real life, honest to God spaceship. People are gonna go on that thing, fly into outer space, and they're gonna come back and land. That's that's real stuff, right? And yeah. and that's progress and that's that's the future, right? And then when I took my kids to Cape Canaveral, the spaceships were there, but they were in museums, right? They were, they were locked up mm-hmm. and they had been put away and, you know, they're on display and you can see them and you can walk right up to them, but they're not out there in the world doing it. And so, you know, when I look at the new space programs that we have right now, I think about not only, you know, obviously we want them to succeed, we want them to be successful, you know, you know, who's going to get to space first? Is it going to be Bezos or Elon, you know, but that's, you know, that's beside the point. The The real point is 
the hope and the vision that this can provide, not just to you know my generation, but to my kids right. to say, hey, there is a frontier and we're going to cross it and we're going to conquer it because isn't that what America is all about, right? America is a collection yep. of the people who said, you know, we're, we're not going to be stuck in the past. There's something new. We're going to go see what that's all about and we're going to build something there and we're going to make it amazing and we're going to make it wonderful. And so Americans always were the pioneers and Americans always were the people that were conquering whatever the next great horizon was. And I think that right now that is space. And so I think that's something that the space program, you know, and we can get into all the you know idiosyncrasies of, you know, Bezos and Musk and the rest of it. But I think that's something that it represents for America as a society and in terms of the actual, just the ethos of America as a country. Yeah, gosh, the next frontier. And I agree with you. I, hope, I, I am- We don't talk about that anymore, do we? We don't talk about we, that. You're right, we don't, but we have to We have to keep that mentality. You're right, that's that's what this country was built upon. That's why people came here. That's, that's always been the way that we've operated as Americans. And we can never let that slip away. That's something very, uniquely American and very special um, to, to each right. and every and if the American. the CCP is going to be in our way, then we're going to have to say, sorry, don't think so, Beijing. Yep. No, don't That's think so, right. Xi Jinping. Doi bu qi. Oh, see? Oh, my gosh. There, and we have it. To, next time you can come <laughs> on. I'm very I'll sorry. French, very sorry. And you can, you can speak Mandarin. It's perfect. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Look, you, you're really such a great voice. Keep doing what you do. Everybody, I want you to go out and, and check this book out. I'm going to check out your book. I think it's something we can all, you, we all need to stay informed. And it's very hard, Jack, I feel like these days to truly stay informed because there is so much suppression. There is so much filter um, by outlets that, you know, might operate on another side of the aisle, sadly. Uh, so it's great to have people out there like you who are are giving us the truth and giving us the information for us to take in. And, and I hope you'll come back because I feel like there's so much more I want to cover with you. It was a great conversation today. So so thank you, Jack Posobiec. Thanks for coming on The Right View. We hope you will come back very soon. Um, and to all of our viewers, all of our listeners, thanks as always. We'll see you back here next time for more of The Right View.